All right. Hello, 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 everybody. Um, just letting Laurent in, who's going to be our host today. Sorry, we were just having a couple technical difficulties there. Hopefully, everybody's having a great day. Um, friendly reminder, throw yourself on mute um, unless we have a question from you or anything like that. Um, that way, you won't be jumping onto the screen. But definitely, near the end, when we do our typical Q&A section, um, we might ask you to unmute yourself. Then as we get going, I'll also just go through, see who's unmuted. I'll just mute you so you don't have to worry about that. Um, so today, like I mentioned, we've got Laurent joining. Um, we're just having a couple technical difficulties here, but he'll start sharing his screen once uh, he gets logged on here. Uh, figured while we're waiting, I might as well start our first poll here um, because today we're going to be talking about seismic loads. Um, so very curious to learn how many of you guys are using ASCE 7 um, for seismic or wind, and then within that, which version you guys are using. Um, as we'll talk about throughout the session here. Um, one sec. Got to make Laurent a host. Forgot to do that. Um, as we're talking, as we'll talk about during today's ses session, we have ASCE 710 and 716 as our um, standards within ClearCalcs, but very curious to learn from those of you who are already using 722, so that way we can get that added into ClearCalcs um, in the future. Super interesting so far. Um, it looks like about 21% of us are using 710, 53%, which makes sense, are using 716. And then there's three out of 34 of you, so 9% of you guys are using 722. And for those of you who aren't yet using uh, ASCE 7, uh, hopefully today will be a good learning opportunity so that way you could start to do those calcs um, on your own. But what I'll do, I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll. That was a nice little stall while we were getting our technical difficulties uh, set up there. And we'll go ahead and start the webinar right now. So like I mentioned before, as you guys could have seen from that question, um, today we're going to be talking about seismic analysis to ASE 716. And this is for residential construction. Uh, go ahead and say hello in the chat as we usually do. Name, title, where you're joining us from. It's always nice to learn a bit more about where you guys are joining us from around the country or around the world. And we can go ahead on to the next slide here. So quick about clearcalcs.com. For those of you who are unfamiliar or maybe you've trialed us a long time ago and you kind of forget, um, clearcalcs is a cloud-based structural calculation software, um, helping engineers, architects, building designers design uh, by bringing FEA tools with easy to use interface for uh, wood, steel, cold form steel, concrete, engineered lumber, um, and then also uh, CMU masonry as of recently. Um, we're aiming to be more accurate. We wanna eliminate wasted time. And like I mentioned, cloud-based. So we are available everywhere. And then just to add a few, just to spice this slide up a bit, because I'm sure if you guys have joined us um, the past however many months, um, it's the same slide over and over. So like I mentioned before, we want to be more accurate. So one way we want to do that is to be as transparent as possible. We do not want to be black box. Um, so you could see here what we call our help accordion or debug mode. Um, you could expand any input field within clear calcs, get an additional description and then also get a reference to the applicable uh, code or standard for that input. Um, so like I mentioned, don't wanna be black box. And then this next screenshot here, um, again, aiming to eliminate wasted time. One feature that we can highlight here is our member selector. So this is a screenshot from our wood, uh, wood beam design. You can go ahead and here, filter between type, manufacturer, species, size, grade, any one of those filters, as many or as little that you want to use in this specific uh, screenshot. I said I only want to see LVLs from Weyerhaeuser, and then I'm seeing in real time what's passing, what's failing, and if I want to bump up or bump down a size. 
And then lastly here, um, just like I mentioned before, available everywhere. So we are a cloud-based platform, like I mentioned. And then what we also have is your one feature that highlights that is our audit log. Ah, so okay. you're going to be able to see uh, who's making what change when in real time, um, even if you are working remote. That way you guys can keep each other accountable and see who's in the calculation uh, doing some calcs. <laughs> And then a quick and then just friendly reminder, I'll go through and make sure everybody's muted once I'm done talking here, but friendly reminder just to throw yourself on mute. Um, just so that way um, it's not interrupting the presentation, but meeting the presenters here. So my name's Connor. I'm our director of customer success. So here to make sure you're successful in clear calcs, whether that be before you sign up, after you sign up, just sending help videos, booking one-on-one um, -on -one time, so that way we can get your questions answered. And then the man of the hour is Laurent, professional engineer. Um, he's our North American engineering content lead. So all these new calculators you guys are seeing pushed out in the US here, he is uh, leading that charge. Last thing here, then I'll kick it off to Laurent, so that way we can really get into the meat and potatoes. Um, I see many people are already sending comments in the chat, which is awesome to see. If you guys have questions throughout today's webinar, send the questions there. Um, so that way we can kind of collate those. And when we have our 30 minute, 15 to 30 minute Q and A section at the end of today's webinar, um, we can either answer them, during, answer them during that, or as we go throughout the webinar, we can answer them if it makes sense to just uh, interrupt and ask it on that slide. But at this point, I'll go ahead and kick it off to Laurent and yeah, send questions if you guys have them. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Connor, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm pretty excited to be talking about this today. We'll be talking earthquakes and seismic loads. And I'll uh, start this presentation with a very small caveat. There's a lot to earthquakes. They are pretty complicated uh, phenomena we're not gonna cover everything. Um, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna go focus more, I think on the residential side, on small scale structures, what that might look like on um, a typical low rise project. We're not gonna dive into the mechanics of how earthquakes happen or how they affect say, you know, skyscrapers or something like that. Um, you're not gonna hear us talk about tune mass dampers or anything like that today. We're gonna keep it simple. Um, but that said, I'm hoping that everybody here is going to come out of there with, you know, something new that they learned about earthquakes and hopefully as well some idea about how clear calcs can help you um, calculate those seismic loads and design for them in your uh, in your project. So um, what we'll be talking about today with that said. Um, We'll have a brief introduction, you know, what is a seismic load, what is seismic analysis, um, and then we're going to look at what the standard is for seismic loads in America. We're going to talk about what parameters affect seismic loads and how we actually calculate them. Then we'll look at how clear calcs can help us with that um, for seismic loads. We're also going to go through a worked example to finish it all off and then a small conclusion, obviously. So let's get started. Um, Seismic loads, how does this happen? Um, I think we've all heard of an earthquake before. Um, I'm going to guess most of us have felt one, um, hopefully not too big of an earthquake, but I've probably felt one in the past. Um, kind of scary, the whole ground moves under you, um, you hear stuff shaking in the house, something like that. Um, it is quite a natural phenomenon that happens on earth. But if you're a building, you don't like earthquakes. Um, movement, especially as civil engineers, structural engineers, acceleration, the only acceleration that we like is the acceleration of gravity. So when we get a new kind of acceleration from the ground shaking, that's always a little scary for our buildings. Um, what's important to note here is that earthquake forces are a bit different than other forces we typically design for. And the big reason for that is say, if we're thinking about wind loads or live loads, they're coming from something external. They've got the, you know, the pressure of the wind pushing on the building or the, the weight of the people pushing down on the floor. Whereas for earthquakes, the forces actually come from the building itself. And it really goes back to um, our friend Isaac Newton, who said force is mass times acceleration. When you've got mass in a building and the ground is shaking, that ground is accelerating. Therefore, you have a force. 
So that's where that force is, uh, is coming from. Now, we know what the seismic force is um, or where it's coming from. Now, how do we analyze it? So apologies, I think there was supposed to be a picture here. Um, basically, seismic load analysis at the um, you know, big scheme of thing, we know that the ground is going to shake. We can do some cool statistics, some fun stuff with that. Um, and then we can do some structural analysis to uh, understand basically how will a building behave during an earthquake? And what are the forces that are going to go through the members in the building? Um, is it going to yield? Um, is it going to deflect? Was it going to sway? All that fun stuff that all fits under a seismic load analysis. Um, and then on the other side of that is also how much will the ground move? How fast will it move? Um, how often will it move? All of these things are also something I would consider in a seismic load analysis. Um, and then obviously, I, I don't think I'm surprising anybody here, but if you live in a seismic region, it's pretty important that you're building um, have a seismic analysis to make sure that it's not going to fall over during a design earthquake. So um, pretty obvious, but I have to make sure to mention it. Um, okay, so we said we talk about the code. If you are in America, and I did see there's a few Canadians out here. So hello, I'm from Ottawa. So um, hello, uh, dear Canadians. Um, one day, I hope that we'll be able to do this presentation, but with the Canadian context. But today, we'll be talking about the US. So um, Law of the land in the US is basically ASCE 7, basically in, in every building structure that you are. Um, would love to hear in the chat if you've designed stuff, I, I think other than perhaps petroleum industry, um, I think most of it's gonna be ASCE 7. If you've got a local building code that's using something else than ASCE 7, would love to hear this. Um, but basically this is where you're gonna be um, living for seismic analysis in general. Now, in most states right now, um, ASC 716, so the 2016 edition, is the one that's being used. And the reason for that is that most states right now are using the International Building Code 2018 or 2021, which both refer to this one. Um, coming up soon, though, in 2024, so a few months from now, IBC 2024 is going to be adopting the next edition of ASC 722. Um, it's very interesting to see the results in that poll, however. See, uh, quite a few of you are actually using the 2022 edition already. Um, would love to hear where you are located, um, why you're using ASC 722. Is it your jurisdiction um, that's insisting on this, or is it your clients who want the newest and best standard or something else? Would love to hear what that looks like. Um, but today, we'll mostly focus on ASC 716, since that is the law of the land in most of the U.S. right now. Um, I did have a slide. I will have a slide at the end, though, where we'll discuss briefly what the changes are in the 2022 edition. Um, it's nothing too crazy, so most of the stuff I'm going to be talking about still applies. Um, but like I said, we'll go over the changes afterwards. Okay, next we're going to look at site class. So, what is site class? It's a method. Basically, we want to account for the quality of the ground under the building and. The way we'll typically do that is it's determined based on a geotech report. Um, we can use the default site class D. So you'll see this pretty often. If you don't have a geotech report, for instance, um, and that might happen, for instance, um, for a small residential project where it's pretty hard to justify the cost of a, um, a geotech report, um, you'll use site class D. Um, this can have a pretty big impact on design. So if, say, you're using default site class D, but actually you could justify, you know, you're building this on hard rock, your loads, your seismic loads could actually go down by half in some cases. So um, in some cases, especially if you're talking about a bigger building, when you've got, you know, hundreds of tons of steel or something like that going in, definitely worth um, looking at that site class um, investigation. Um, another thing to keep in mind here with site class if you're on a site that's got poor soil, so that's typically, we'll call it site class F. So if you've got some, some really clay soil or so some other weird stuff going on in there, um, or if you're near an active fault, so especially if you're near the Bay Area or in California, that's, that's a pretty common one where you'll have quite a few active faults in the same area, um, you may actually be required to have a special um, study for this. And these can get pretty complicated. We're not going to jump into those today. Um, I'm going to guess if you're living and designing in those areas, however, you're probably familiar with those. 
I'll also note that there are some exceptions, especially if you're dealing with um, low rise buildings, for instance, or light frame uh, buildings as well. Okay, now one thing I really wanted to mention here is it's called period. Um, so this is something that keeps coming back up when we're talking about seismic analysis. And um, basically what's period, um, taking it back to high school, one over frequency. So a building that's got a 10 Hertz frequency or natural frequency, for instance, would have a period, a natural period or fundamental period of 0 0.1 second. Um, and the idea here is that earthquakes, when they happen, stuff shakes around a lot. Um, you can plot it on a graph and you'll start seeing that they, they've actually got kind of a frequency to them and they've got some specific acceleration. Um, these will depend a lot on the local geology. So um, some areas of the country might have earthquakes that shake faster at higher frequencies than others or something like that. And likewise, I'm sure this isn't any surprise, um, buildings have got a fundamental period. So what that means is if you shake it a little bit, it'll start shaking a lot more. Um, what that means, though, with earthquakes, what gets really scary is if the earthquake shakes at the same um, frequency or period as the building, the fundamental period of the building, you can get resonance. And that's when stuff starts shaking really bad. Um, so just to kind of show an example, I put a YouTube video here of this is a basically a shake table. So a earthquake simulator. And we've got three buildings here of different heights. And we're just going to look as the, the table shakes at different rates, you'll see that the buildings also shake differently. So I'll just hit play here. It's just gonna... You can see the shorter building is, is moving a lot now because the table is moving fast. And now they're slowing it down a little bit. And all of a sudden, the middle one is starting to shake a lot more. And you can see the other two are still shaking, but not nearly as bad as the other two one, as the one in the middle. Now we're slowing it down even more. Now, wow, that tall building is shaking like crazy. And the bottom one's barely moving, you'll see, right? So that's what we're talking about in terms of period here. So those three buildings, if I just kind of pause it here, have very different periods. They'll resonate at different frequencies. Um, therefore, the same earthquake might not actually affect them the same way. So that's why you'll, you know, you'll see the news sometimes after an earthquake, um, some buildings of a specific height will all have extensive damage, but really short ones and really tall ones will be perfectly fine. Um, I think there, there was an earthquake in Mexico City, for instance, where that was the case, or sometimes it'll only be the tall buildings or sometimes only the short buildings, um, who knows? But the, the point here is period is a very, very important parameter when we're talking about seismic analysis. Okay, this is a pretty big slide, but here we're going to be talking a bit more about the seismic parameters. So I talked about um, how different earthquakes, different areas will shake at different um, periods. We've got some really smart people in the uh, USGS, especially, who basically compiled data. They've got seismic meters everywhere across the country, across the world, in fact, and they basically just build up trends. They look at every earthquake that happens, look at what frequency is happening at, what accelerations that are happening in the ground, um, all that fun stuff. Crazy analysis goes on behind the scenes, some statistical analysis. From that, the uh, USGS creates what we call a response spectrum. And basically what that means in like a one sentence thing is it's basically saying, if the building's fundamental period is X, a design earthquake in this area will cause peak acceleration Y. So we've got an example of a spectrum on the right here. So if I've got, say, my, so on the horizontal axis, it's going to be my fundamental period. So if I've got, say, I'm just going to pick a random spot. If I'm here, I've got, say, 0 0.7 second period. On the vertical axis is my acceleration. So I will see 0 0.7 second. Boom, I would expect my um, acceleration that the building will feel to be this amount here. Um, and this gets super valuable for us because we can make it quite simple, actually. Um, big thing here um, in the ASCE 7 code, at the simplest form, we can actually get this down to three parameters. So the short period acceleration, so that's the SA over here at the top or the flat part. 
that's basically saying your building is just going to move, come along for the ride with the crown. There's no kind of shaking, special shaking thing happening. This is typically for a very short building. Then we've got our long period acceleration. So that's where, you know, you've got a longer building. So the ground will usually be shaking faster than the, uh, than the building moves or, or follows along. So there'll be a bit more of that, that shaking um, effect. And then we've got that long period transition period. So you can see the TL here. And that's going to be for really tall buildings um, where you're going to have kind of different effects, but similar effects again, where the building's going to shake at a different rhythm than the, uh, than the ground. Um, we'd love to hear if you want to post in the chat um, when you're designing, which one of these periods of the spectrum are typically governing your designs. Um, for low rise, in our experience here, it's typically just been the... Uh, Short period acceleration governs everything, but would love to hear um, if you're seeing different things as well. Um, okay, so um, next up, seismic design category. So these, I think in the past were kind of called seismic zones where they were assigned to different regions of the US. Now, these seismic design categories are very similar. The idea here is that when we're talking about earthquakes, a lot of the stuff, you know, we can put it on a nice plot, um, whoops, on a nice plot like this, where it's like a very smooth curve and you can match it exactly one to one. But there's some stuff that is basically just a yes or no. Um, just an example, for instance, like, are you allowed to use plain concrete? The answer is yes or no. There's no kind of spectrum for this. Um, so the idea with the seismic design categories is we can de basically determine based on the acceleration. So you can see, for instance, this SDS. So this is a acceleration. Depending on the acceleration you would expect for a typical earthquake in this area and for your ground, um, your site category, and for your risk category. So if you're building a hospital versus a house, it might be different. Um, we'll assign a seismic design category. And, and what that means is the higher your seismic design category basically goes from A to F. Um, the higher it is, the more requirements you'll have. So especially once you go past SDC um, D, you start getting a lot more requirements. So you might have stuff to make sure that there's not going to be any brittle failure. Um, so the big example here is plain concrete, even in like uh, uh, footings, for instance, where typically you'd be fine using plain concrete footings. There's going to be very, very heavy restrictions on when you're allowed to use plain concrete footings or plain concrete walls or something like that. Um, other examples might be um, with cantilevered columns that don't have a lot of ductility inherent to them. They might be restricted in higher SDCs, um, different stuff like that. But basically the idea here is it's a system that lets us add different requirements based on how bad the earthquakes in this area are expected to be. So you've got the map here on the right, for instance. You can see the, 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 the pink is the worst case. So this is probably... If you're designing here, you'll probably end up in seismic design category E or F. And then if you're in the white area, you're probably in seismic design category A, for instance, where there's not going to be basically any, any concerns for seismic uh, loads. You're just basically only going to be designing for, uh, for wind in that case. In fact, if you're in Florida, for instance, it's, it's quite specific to the code says you don't even have to think about seismic. Um, okay. Next, I'm going to talk about the seismic force resisting system. So the SFRS. So this is basically your building is shaking sideways. Something's got to prevent it from tipping over. That's where your SFRS comes in. Um, so examples of this might be wood shear walls or steel cross bracing or portal frames or um, concrete shear walls or masonry shear walls or something like that. Those are all forms of um, seismic force resisting systems. These might also help you resist gravity loads, especially if you've got, say, a concrete um, bearing wall or something like that. It might have two purposes. They will probably also be resisting wind loads. Um, it would be quite rare to have two systems independent of each other resisting wind and seismic. In some cases, that happens. Um, but typically, this would just be your lateral force resisting system. Um, so when we're talking about these in a seismic context, there's three parameters that we really care about. The biggest one is called the response modification coefficient. That's the R coefficient. And what that does is basically um, when you're dealing with, say, um, wood that's got a lot of nails in it or steel that's really ductile, 
as your building shakes a lot, the code is actually going to let you use that yielding that happens in the steel or in the nails, in the wood or something like that to absorb a lot of the energy in your building. Um, so basically, as that building moves, that steel yields a little bit. Um, what it does in practice is it reduces the forces that are going through um, your seismic force system. And quite often, it can be like a big reduction. Like we're talking, you know, you go from uh, 100 kips to 20 kips. You know, you, you're cutting it down by a factor of five, sometimes even more. Um, so very important factor, um, has a huge impact on your, your design and the forces that you're going to have to design for. Next is the overstrength factor. So what that overstrength factor does is basically accounting for the fact that if you order a steel beam and you say, I want it at 50 KSI, it's probably going to come out at 60, 70, sometimes 80 KSI. Um, and what that means is if you're counting on that beam to yield as part of your seismic resisting system, if it doesn't yield when you expect it to, if it actually just keeps taking the forces elastically, um, it might actually mean that some components are gonna get more force than you would expect them to. So if you're designing this whole system, um, say your anchor's at the bottom, assuming that the steel's gonna yield at 50 KSI and it yields at 80 KSI, you might actually end up with um, forces in your anchors that are much higher than you expected. So that's what that overstrength factor accounts for. Basically what it's there for is making sure that those critical components that don't really have any ductility, but are super critical to maintaining a load path for your uh, seismic loads, making sure that they're actually strong enough for the worst case where your steel or, or your wood or whatever ends up being stronger than you expected. And lastly, we've got our CD value. That's the deflection amplification factor. And what that does is it increases deflections for yielding. So we talked about the code lets you account for yielding to reduce your forces. Um, that's fine, but you don't get a free ride. When you've got yielding, you've got deflections. You've got much, much higher deflections. So you need to think about that in terms of that building is going to sway a lot more all of a sudden because it's got yielding. That's going to affect um, how your weight's distributed. You might have some um, P delta effects. You might have some overturning effects. That's where that CD factor comes in. Um, so it becomes very critical, especially with taller structures when we want to look at stability. Um, important thing to note here, um, we talked about SDC, seismic design categories before. These um, come in very important when we're talking about um, seismic force resisting systems. So I put in a snippet here from the code. Um, you'll see on the right, it's got five columns, right? Seismic design category B, C, D, E, F. So if we look at, say, ordinary reinforced concrete shear walls, seismic design categories B and C, you'll see NL. That means no limit. So you can build your um, building with ordinary reinforced concrete shear walls as high as you want. If you're in categories B and C, then if you're in categories D, E, and F, you'll see NP, not permitted. So you actually can't use this system. The code doesn't let you use that system to resist your seismic forces. Instead, you'll see you actually have to use um, special reinforced concrete shear walls. So then you'll be able to build them up to 160 feet high. Um, what the special means here versus ordinary, um, it means we've got a lot more detailing requirements usually. So there'll be some stuff about um, perhaps the type of hooks you're using in your walls, um, how you're anchoring your rebar, um, the connections between your walls and your slabs or something like that. Um, these are all things that you have to consider at that point. What you'll notice as well is that response modification coefficient goes from four to five when we're going there as well. So you get to use a new system that's that that you can use it in higher seismic areas, but you also kind of get a bonus here that your loads are probably going to be smaller when you're using that um, that special system as well. Okay, so next Laurent, up, if I could just there's... jump in super quick yeah. here, um, just had a question. Figured out it would make sense while we're on the slide. For the overstrength factor, you mentioned it increases forces in critical components. Would you just be able to give like an example or two of what you mean by critical components there? Absolutely, absolutely. So the standard AFC7 actually does a pretty good job at describing these. Um, the example here might be, for instance, if you have um, a shear wall where you've got uh, 
you know, more than two stories, a wood shear wall where you've got more than two stories and you've got collectors between shear walls. So where you've got, say, I don't know, a two by 12 rim joist or something like that, that's collecting forces from shear wall above and sending them to the shear wall under. Um, that collector doesn't necessarily have a lot of ductility to it. Um, those shear walls have a lot of ductility to them because of all the nailing that can yield and all that. Therefore, that collector, we would expect to, we would use the overstrength factor to make sure that that collector won't, um, won't basically break before the shear wall yields. So that would be an example. Another example might be, um, and that's probably a more common one actually, is concrete anchors. So there are ways you can design concrete anchors to have a lot of ductility. Um, typically in residential projects, you might not be using that. So you would basically assume that your um, concrete anchors are just going to like rip out of the concrete uh, or something like that. It's very brittle failure mechanism. That said, um, what we'll do again in that case is the forces that are going through that anchor will bump them up by the overstrength factor just to make sure that if, for instance, the nails are yielding later than expected or something like that, the forces going through those anchors are um, are still going to be able to be resisted. I hope awesome. that answers the question. Yeah, thanks, Laurent. Yeah, let us know in the, in the chat if that answered your question, um, but great question there. Yeah, and would love to hear from uh, from everyone as well if you're, um, you know, when you're designing these, if you've got... Um, specific examples or, or times where you use this overstrength factor and you're like, huh, this is interesting. Um, love to hear those stories. Okay, analysis methods. ASCE 7 basically gives you uh, three different analysis methods. Um, the most common one and the one we'll be talking about today is the equivalent lateral force method. This is pretty simple. Actually, it's quite a simple method of analysis. It's very straightforward. Um, you're using very simple models, um, but it gets the job done. Um, it's based again on kind of statistics, making looking at how buildings behave and and just kind of doing a big rough average of it all and getting some sort of conservative solution. Next up, you've got the linear dynamic analysis. And that one's interesting in that um, you're actually gonna be looking at how the building's gonna shake when you've got an earthquake. Um, so we've got two types here, modal response, spectrum analysis, linear response history, <laughs> pretty big words. Um, basically what it means is you're gonna be looking at how does your building shake when it's exposed to different frequencies of earthquakes. So if you've got an earthquake shaking really fast, um, how's it gonna respond? How's it gonna respond to it? If you've got an earthquake moving really slow, how's it gonna respond to it? Then you're gonna match that response with the local, um, basically the local uh, properties of an earthquake. Um, and then you're still gonna be able to then, this is basically linear. So you're not gonna account for any yielding or anything like that in your analysis. It's very simple analysis in a way. Um, but then once you have this, you'll go back to those um, R factors, overstrength factors, CD factors, and you'll just basically multiply your loads that you get by these factors. The last one we get is the nonlinear response history analysis. And that one is, it, you know, I, I wrote that, that it's the Cadillac of analyses. Um, what we're looking to do in this case is we're just going to simulate the whole structure. We're going to think about yielding. We're going to think about secondary effects with geometry, with sway and all that. Um, and in fact, we're not going to use the R factor, these three factors. We're going to ignore them because these are actually already built into the analysis at that point. So we're simulating how a steel beam actually yields the stress strain curve, all that fun stuff. Um, so that's by far the most accurate in general. Um, it's you're basically just planning to simulate like there's this the earthquake and this is how the building responds. That said, it's very complex. It takes a lot of time, um, both to set up the analysis and to run the analysis. It offers the most accurate results. The other thing that makes it tricky is it's very hard for design because as you get your loads, you update, you, you might resize some members. You need to rerun that analysis again with your new members. It takes, again, a lot of time. Um, because it's nonlinear, you might get unexpected results where members that you uh, beefed up, actually end up taking even more load now. So you need to make them even bigger or you need to rethink your system or something like that. Um, so in the tallest buildings, in the, the weirdest buildings, I'll say this is what you need. Um, typically, especially for a kind of small scale residential or, or low rise buildings, we would never be touching this. We'd be purely looking at the uh, equivalent lateral force method. 
Um, love to hear in the chat, um, actually, if you're using other methods than these three, or if you're using the, the, the dynamic analyses, uh, would love to hear about it. Um, for now, we'll stick to the ELF, however, equivalent lateral force method. So talking a little bit about the equivalent lateral force method, what it does, we're using very simple equations here. And what we're getting at the end are just basically forces that we apply to the building, um, very simple forces. You know, you just apply it to your, your, your floor and it goes into your, your bracing system or your, your shear walls, and that's it. So how we can make this happen, um, big part here is that we're really using a simple formula for the fundamental period of the building. Um, you'll see I put a, the, the formula there on the left. It's basically the CT factor times the height of the buildings to this X exponent. And the CT and X values vary if you're using steel or concrete or other. Um, and that's basically it. It's very, very approximate, this fundamental period. But it's based on you know, years and years of research looking at uh, you know, big picture what uh, these, these buildings, how they respond. Um, even then for, you know, low rise buildings, especially if you've got shear walls or, or X bracing or something like that, the period is going to be really low anyways. It's going to be a really stiff building. So typically it's just going to be the short period acceleration that governs. And what I mean by that, just going to go back to the spectrum. You're typically going to be in the area here where it's flat, this SA equals SDS, um, so actually the, the period, you still need to calculate it, obviously, to make sure that you're actually falling there, but it's going to have relatively little impact on the seismic loads versus if you were, say, in this zone on the right, where actually your, your accelerations depend a lot on the period. So I'm just going to go back. Um, you can see here the formula. The other big thing that we have is the CS factor. So that's the, um, the basically the seismic force coefficient. And you'll see, so we've got SD1. That's our design acceleration um from the uh the, the the local parameters t our period in this case and then this r over ie r is our response modification coefficient so you'll see r is under the division so if i've got r is equal to five i'm cutting down the cs value by five and then this ie value is the importance coefficient so that's if i have say a hospital it'll be much higher value um, versus a barn, for instance, where it'll be lower. The idea here is to provide um, the right reliability amount during an earthquake. And then once we've got that CS value, we just multiply it by W, which is the weight of the building. It's that simple. Um, so it's quite easy to use, um, quite functional. And basically, as far as I understand, we're basically using this in, in most, if not all low rise buildings in the US right now. Okay, next up, I mentioned the W. So that is here, W, that is the effective seismic weight. And that one's a little bit tricky, not too tricky. Um, biggest thing is in an earthquake, dead load. That is your killer. So if you've got a big concrete building, it's gonna be heavy. That's a lot of mass that's moving around. Thinking back to our Newton formula, F equals to MA. Acceleration is going to be the same in any earthquake, or sorry, for the same earthquake, we're going to see the same acceleration, but that weight, that mass is going to change. And so that's going to drive up your forces a lot. So dead load is the biggest one. Um, and in general, you'll also have to add a 10 PSF floor weight there for partitions, unless you're already accounting for them uh, directly. Then you'll have 25% of your live load only if it's for storage. So Typically, you might not actually need to include your live load in the seismic weight. Now, this gets a little confusing. You might still need to include it into your load combination. That includes um, your earthquake. You just don't need to include it in the seismic weight. Um, oops. In this formula to find the seismic base shear. I think the reason for that is basically humans in general, a little bit mushy, they can move around um, with the building. And I guess the, 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 the contribution there to lateral loads is basically like uh, negligible. That, and that's from, that's from research. However, if it's a storage live load, um, the code asks you to put 25%. So obviously a, a box full of books is gonna move with the building a lot more than a person who can sway and keep their balance as the building moves. 
Um, other thing too, if your roof snow load, and that's the flat roof snow load, is greater than 45 pounds per square foot, you have to include 15% of that load um, into your seismic weight as well. Um, important to note here, that's the flat roof snow load. So if you've got a really steep roof, um, you still need to use that flat roof snow load in that 45 PSF determination. So just a little trick there to keep in mind. Um, and obviously anything else that's permanently attached to the building. So that's, you know, um, rooftop equipment. If you've got a green roof, the soil on there, um, if you've got a tank full of water or something like that, um, these are all things that you'll also need to include in that, that seismic weight. Just to now, jump in really that, quick. Whoops. Sorry, Laurent. Yeah, um, of course. Just got a, a comment from Austin Metz here. He said, potentially it is a uh, 20% of that flat snow road snow load, maybe that depends on the, um, the standard, whether it's 710, 716, or 722, um, but just oh. to bring awareness to that. Thank you, Austin. Um, okay, yeah, I, I might have made a mistake here. I'm, my apologies if that's the case. I believe that there is a bit of a weird thing here with the building code, the international building code, into how we combine seismic loads with... Um, uh, with snow loads. And I, I do recall that 20% being a little tricky or showing up. Um, I see somebody else said 20% over 30 PSF in most areas. So, all right. I'm going to apologize here. I think I might have uh, put in the wrong numbers here. Um, so thank you, Austin and engineering who wrote this. What I'll say is don't take my word for this. Um, use the code. That is the law of the land, as we mentioned. This is only here to help you. But thank you, Austin and engineering, for sharing this because um, don't want to be sharing misinformation either. Okay. Um, one last thing I'm going to talk about here is configuration irregularities. So in a low-rise building, typically, there's not going to be too many of these. And in a typical house, there might not be any. Um, but basically, we're looking at cases that are going to make your building not respond like a perfect, um, like a perfect block of concrete or something like that. So it might actually affect how the analysis, the accuracy of the analysis. So there's five different types of horizontal irregularities. So an example here, for instance, is if your shear walls aren't actually perpendicular to each other, or they call it a non-parallel system. Um, I put a picture at the bottom there. Um, and then there's also vertical irregularities. So if, for instance, your shear walls, their length varies a lot over two different stories, um, that's going to affect the behavior of the structure, might affect the results of the analysis. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of them here. Again, they might not affect most projects. However, you should still be familiar with them. I'd encourage you to take a look in ASCE 7 and, and just look at the conditions for when these actually matter. Just because you have an irregularity doesn't mean that your building is not going to withstand an earthquake. It just means it might have some additional detailing requirements. Sometimes they'll let you get away with the irregularity by just bumping up the loads a little bit. Sometimes you might have to do kind of an ex extra analysis of some kind, especially with torsion. Um, but it's something to keep in mind. And especially if you're, if, you're, if you're launching into a new project and from experience, you can tell that this project doesn't quite look the same as the other ones you've done before. Um, good moment to kind of go back to ASCE 7 and look at those irregularities and see, um, see what you can do there. Okay. Um, okay, I promised I would talk a little bit about ASCE 722. Um, that's going to be coming up, like I said, um, the next International Building Code is going to be referring to it, so it's going to become the, uh, the law of the land in most of the U.S. Um, so, biggest change here seismic values, the code asks you now to derive them from the USGS database. So a lot of you, I'm going to guess, are familiar with the ASC7 online hazards tool. Uh, basically, you're going to include your site class in there as well now. So in the past, there was different factors for different site classes. The USGS basically takes care of all of that for you, and it's just going to spit out the answers that you need um, automatically. Um, so there's no more going through the maps and looking at that. I believe there is a way you can still look through the map, but generally you should just be using that website um, from now on. Um, on our end at ClearCalcs, we're probably going to be bringing this into ClearCalcs as well so that you don't need to go to the uh, to another website where we can just 
based on your project address, be able to uh, pull up this data automatically. Maybe let us know in the chat if that's something that sounds interesting to you. Um, another thing that gets interesting, they've added now three new site classes. So A, B, C, D, E, F wasn't enough. We now have B, C, C, D, and D, E, which you can kind of guess, I think, fit in between B and C, C and D, et cetera. Um, and then the default site class, where I mentioned, um, in general, you could just use site class D. In ASCE 722, we're actually going to have to look at three different site classes. So we're going to look at the accelerations for class C, class CD, or class D. And we're going to take the worst case of those three. And that's going to be our site class um, to use for design. In most cases, I'd expect that this is still going to remain just site class D for default. But there might be some weird cases with different soil parameters or different uh, fundamental periods where this, this would change. Um, and then at the end, the last thing here, um, those R omega CD values for um, seismic force resisting systems. Um, they've added quite a few new ones. So a big one, um, CLT shear walls. So these are really quickly starting to become a big thing out here, um, especially in Canada. I think I'm seeing the same in America as well. Uh, up to now, there was very little guidance on designing those for um, seismic loads and especially shear walls. So thankfully now um, this code is going to provide those values. There are also other ones, I think some to do with masonry, some of them with other uh, steel systems, for instance. Um, so I encourage you to take a look. Um, you might get some inspiration for new lateral systems for your next project as well. Um, would love to hear actually if, if anybody here is designing with CLT right now. Um, know it's becoming bigger, um, but yeah, send us in the chat. Okay, so we've talked about seismic loads. Let's talk about clear calcs a little bit now. How does that work in clear calcs? So in clear calcs, we have got a seismic load calculator. Um, basically, it goes through everything I mentioned in these slides. I don't know why I did that, but anyways, um, you're going to be able to put in your parameters, put in your weight and all that. We'll take care of the calculations. And at the end, you'll basically get your, your seismic shears per story. Um, and you'll see them on a nice diagram. And the cool thing is, for those of you who are familiar with clear calcs, these work with load linking now. Um, you can load link all the way to your shear walls. So therefore, if you change, say, your um, seismic weight or something like that, you'll be able to be confident that your shear walls are actually going to be updating for those new loads as well. So no more copy pasting loads, nothing like that. If you're new to clear calcs, really encourage you to check us out, check out the load linking feature. Um, probably one of our biggest time savers and error savers as well. Uh, basically what it does is it connects your calculations together so that you never have to copy paste results. Um, they automatically update. So whether that's from a beam, the reactions of a beam onto a column, or like I said, the uh, seismic loads onto a shear wall, um, that's something that we support. Um, so with that, let's just take a look at a quick worked example and conscious that we're a little tight on time here, um, but it's a pretty simple example here. And really it's just gonna be showing how we can put this all into clear calcs. So what we're gonna look at is just a one story, you know, light frame, um, wood house. We're going to be located in Page, Arizona. Um, very beautiful city. I don't know if anybody's from there. Um, hello. <laughs> um, our total roof weight, so including the um, the trusses, the, the roof um, surface, everything, we're going to say 25 pounds per square foot and a flat roof snow load of 20 pounds per square foot. So I'm going to jump into clear calcs now. So if you'll just bear with me, I'm going to switch here. Uh, da, 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 da. uh, whoops, sorry, I did the wrong thing. Okay, I think you should all be seeing my screen now. So, I should here, here we go. Are you all seeing this? Yes, okay. Um, so this is the Clear Calc project interface. Most of you will probably be familiar with this. I said we were in Page, Arizona, so I'm just going to type in Page, Arizona. Uh, perfect. We'll just pick this address. And Arizona 98. Sure, fair enough. We're going to be building something right here. 
So first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to create a seismic load calculator. So I'm going to go here and scroll down to my loads section and select my seismic analysis. And I'm going to create this now. Once this is done, you'll see I've got here different versions of our calculator here. And you'll see also some assumptions. I'm not going to go through them right now, but recommend that you take a look at them just to make sure that, that this corresponds to what you're doing. I'm going to close this now. And this, this is where we're going to start with the map data. So a small scale residential building like this, we're probably just going to assume a D default site class. Um, we could say select class E or up to class A, but we're going to leave it as class D right now. Next is these three parameters, SS, S1, TL. So these are the three parameters I mentioned that are going to help us build our spectrum. That's the, uh, the spectrum that shows the acceleration our building is going to go under. So if I just hover over this I button, you'll see we actually show you a little video how to calculate this. We're going to go also to the ASC7 hazard tool in this case. So I'm going to open this. And we're going to do this. And I'm just going to type here page Arizona. Perfect. Standard version, we're working in ASC 716 right now. So I'm going to pick this one. Risk category for a house that's going to be class two. Um, I realized I didn't touch on this too much um, today. Again, this is something that you should be looking at into your building code or in the ASC 7 code. Select our soil class. We're going to say D default. And we're just going to look at the seismic loads in this case. I'm going to hit view results. It's going to take one second. OK, maybe more than one second. OK, perfect. Now, what I can do here is I can just do the summary view. And I mentioned there's three values that we care about, SS, S1, and TL. So SS 0 0.31. So I'm going to type this here, 0 0.31, S1. 0 0.097, 0 0.097, and TL, six seconds. I'm going to type this here. So this is something that right now we're doing this manually. Eventually in Clear Council, we'd like to do is that the minute you put in your address and those uh, project details, these will automatically um, populate. So if that's something that interests you. If this is something that you would see as a time saver, let us know because it's it's uh, something that we're really considering. Okay, next up, building risk category. Right now, we only support building risk category two, which is what applies conveniently to our one-story house. Um, let us know if you design them with other risk categories. Um, what we've heard generally is basically most of the stuff right now is two for, for buildings and clear calcs, but let us know if you're doing something else. Um, we'd be happy to add the other categories as well. Next, we're going to add the story. So single story, um, right now we've got 20 feet. That's probably a little high for a house. So we're going to type in, say, uh, let's say 12 feet. Um, and actually, yeah, we'll leave it at 12 feet right now. Now, I had mentioned the um, roof weight was 25 pounds per square foot. And we had 20 pounds per square foot of um, snow load. Because that snow load is less than 45 or, or 30, as, as was mentioned in the, the chat, we can ignore it in our seismic weight. So I've got 25 pounds per square foot. I'm going to type 25 PSF. Now, the other thing we need now is you'll see units don't match, right? We're trying to put in PSFs, and it's looking for kips or, or pounds, actually. We need to add the area that this has. So I'm just going to go back to our um, our presentation, and um, let's just look again at this. If we look here, we see we've got a 30 foot by 55 foot um, building. So 25 psf, 30 foot by 55 foot. So I'm going to go back now to my um, my analysis right here. So 30 foot times 55 foot. And you'll see now we've got the, the right, the units match, everybody's happy. 41,250 pounds. That's my effective seismic weight. And with that, 
the last thing to do here, I can skip these two things, custom building period, custom seismic force resisting system. I mentioned it's a light frame um, wall. So actually we're good here. I could open this and you'll see we have a bunch of the different um, seismic force resisting systems. And you can see that R, omega, CD values here as well. But right now we're just dealing with light wood, uh, light frame walls, sheet wood structural panels. So basically wood shear walls. So we're good, we're done. And what we've got now is these parameters, right? So we've got SDS, SD1. So these correspond to that design spectrum. Um, then we've got our seismic design category. So in this case, we're in SDCC. And we've got our seismic base shear, so 2,040 pounds. And given that we've got a single story building, 2,040 pounds is going to be our design seismic load. So now I'm going to do this a little quickly, just so uh, in the interest of time. If I wanted to bring this to my shear walls, what would I do? I'm going to create a new calculation. And I'm going to scroll down now to diaphragm analysis. So diaphragm, this is what's going to connect those lateral loads um, applied over the floor or the roof. That's what's going to take them into the shear walls. So I mentioned we had a 30 foot um, wide building. So I'm just going to make this diaphragm be 30 feet. Whoops. We're going to stick to a flexible diaphragm since this is going to be a wood sheathed diaphragm. And then here, I'm going to go here when you see seismic loads, I'm going to hit this link button. And once I do this, I'm going to say seismic analysis one. And oh, there we go. I'm going to select story one, the only story, 2,040 pounds. And you'll see by default, it applied it over the entire length of the diaphragm. So that seismic load ends up being 68 pounds per linear foot. And you, you can see here, we've got the reactions in our braced wall lines, right? So um, 1,020 pounds on each. Pretty simple, because it's a, a simple one. If I had, say, an interior shield wall line, I could also add this. So interior wall, I could add it, say, at 10 feet. And you would see here, if I switch this to seismic, we would see how the shear gets distributed along the diaphragm. And you could see the reactions. So we'd have 335, 1,020, et cetera. But right now we won't have the interior wall. So we'll just keep this as is. And then the last part, if I want my shear walls, I'm gonna create a new calculation again. And this time I'm gonna create a wood shear wall. So I'm gonna do this now. And we ran a webinar a few months ago on shear wall design actually. Um, the recording's available on our website. I would really encourage you to take a look at this if, if you wanna learn more about shear walls. Just in the interest of time today, I'm not going to really focus too much on the shear wall design. The only thing I'm going to show here is just how to add the loads. So in this case, we've got loads already, but we're not actually going to care about these in this case. I'm just going to delete this, and I'm going to click the link button. It's going to take a second. And then D1, that's my diaphragm. And it's going to take a second again. Braced wall line one, braced wall line two. In this case, they're the same. I'm just going to pick one. And sorry, it's going to take just one second. Okay. And I could add my dead load and transient load if I wanted to. In this case, it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm just going to leave it at zero. And the last thing that you're going to need to add here is this SDS value. Um, pretty soon, we should be able to link this directly. Um, just a bit of a technical issue on our end. But for now, we'll just go back to seismic analysis one. I see 0 0.321. I'm just going to copy that. Come back here and put this SDS value here, 0 0.321. And there we go. I've got, you'll see my shear wall, my, my shear load from the earthquake being applied. Because we're working in ASD here, you'll see it's multiplied by 0 0.7. So 712 pounds, it's applied to my shear walls. Now say I added an opening, um, let's say five feet, six feet, um, just to add a, an opening here, for instance, we'll still be able to calculate it. Now, important part here, um, everything is fine. We're at 47% utilization. If I went back to my seismic analysis and now my seismic weight for some reason went to 40 pounds per square. Let's go 100 pounds per square, but something went terribly wrong. You'll see the little gears, it's recalculating. It's gonna take a few seconds. So doo -doo -doo -doo, doing this and then my shear walls. 
you'll see that now that this is done, oh, I'm not passing anymore. My cord compression is, is actually failing. And once you see that, you'll see. So this is, I didn't touch anything on here. This is purely based on the linking uh, mechanism that we've had. So from our seismic analysis all the way to our shear walls, it's linked. Um, okay. Ran a little bit over time. Um, apologies for that. Um, I'm just going to quickly um, conclude this. This was basically the end of our uh, our presentation anyways. So conclusion, basically, seismic forces are really important. You're probably going to be working in ASC7, and ClearCalx is here to help you with that. And very briefly, what's new in ClearCalx? We just released masonry retaining walls. I think that was one that a lot of people had contacted us about. So really excited to have that out there. Um, you can create that. Just go to our regular cantilever retaining wall calculator, and you'll see a new option there. You can choose between concrete and CMU for your STEM. So really, really excited to have that out there. Let us know what you think. If we missed something or if we can make it better, let us know. We've also got bolt group analysis. Um, really cool one. Um, if you've got a bolt group with eccentric loads, we'll give you the loads in every bolt. Um, we've got open web steel joists as well that have just come out. And coming very soon, as in like uh, this week or the week after, we're going to have basement retaining walls as well. And shear walls are going to work on multiple stories at the same time. So really, really excited to have this coming out. Um, we've been working pretty hard on this. So um, stay tuned. And please, please, please send us your feedback as you try it out, because it's very important for us. And that's how we can make a better software. And webinars coming up. Um, August 30th, we're going to have calculating snow loads for the international building codes. So we've just released a snow load calculator recently. Um, we're going to be diving deeper into this, learning how it works, um, what you can do to reduce your snow loads or, or accommodate them. Um, we're also going to be looking about diaphragm analysis and lateral load linking for shear wall design. So I dove into this super quickly with that design example. We're going to get a lot deeper into it um, in September. And we're going to be looking at ways you can make this super efficient for your design and save a lot of time. And you've got the um, website right there, clearcalps.com webinars to discover more. And with that, thank you all for your time. Um, we're going to have a bit of a survey at the end. Um, would love to hear your feedback. That survey is also how we can send you a PDH um, certificate. So if you need that, please, please, please fill out the survey. That's how we'll be able to uh, send you the certificate. Um, and if you've got any questions, reach out, you know, help at clearcalcs.com. Um, we've got the help button in ClearCalcs as well. Um, you know, our team of engineers, it goes directly to us. We're always reading this every day. We look to respond as fast as we can. Um, and we love it. That's how we can make a better software. So please, please reach out. Um, we're more than happy to help. And we've got a question period. Conscious that we ran a bit over time, but if there's some burning questions, I'm happy to, to answer them right now. I, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, what I was going to say there, Laurent, and we had a one question from Heather and a question from Riaz. Um, just for the sake of time, apologies, we didn't have time to do the, the 10 to 15 minute uh, Q&A section, but Laurent and I will meet and just answer those questions and make sure we send those out. Uh, one question from Heather regarding uh, turning row on and off in a seismic design calculator, and then a question from Riaz about how TL is used in our calcs. So we'll be sure to reach out to you guys and answer those questions. Laurent and I will meet right after this. Um, and then Jesse, I know you mentioned uh, you're looking to get clear calcs. Uh, send a message either to, I'll just send my email in here. Um, you could send it to help at clearcalcs.com or my direct email address here. I'm trying to type as I'm talking and it's not working. Um, so you could send, uh, send me a message, happy to answer any questions and get you set up. Um, yeah, really appreciate everybody joining. Sorry we ran a few minutes over, um, but really wanted to make sure we discussed everything to do with seismic there than how it can be done in clear calcs. Uh, the survey, I see a, a couple questions. The survey will pop up um, once we end the webinar. So you guys will get that automated um, once we end this webinar here. Um, yeah. Let us know if you guys have any questions. Like I mentioned, Heather and Riaz will get back to you guys on those questions. And hopefully everybody has a great rest of your day. Thanks again for joining. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Um, and look forward to seeing you at the next one. Bye-bye, right, everybody.